Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we take you to the Los Angeles premiere of the documentary Indian Point, an exploration of nuclear issues through the lens of the two nuclear reactors located only 25 miles from New York City. We talk with director Ivy Ivy, 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 Mirapol about what led her to devote four years of her life to the project. You will also hear from someone who proved to be a key focal point for the film, former Nuclear Regulatory Commission Chair Gregory Yasko, who attended the screening and took part in the audience Q&A afterwards. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than billionaire convicted sex offender and known pedophile Jeffrey Epstein mentioned to his personal guests, Donald Trump or Bill Clinton, the many times they flew on his private 727 and vacationed on his private sex slave island in the Virgin Islands. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, August 2nd, 2016, And here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Let's just get right to it this week. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of the week. On Monday, August 1st, New York energy regulators approved a plan to pay several upstate nuclear power plants up to $965 million over two years to keep the reactors in service. This despite the fact that the owners of these nuclear facilities have said that they are uneconomic to run without government support. The excuse given for this action by New York Governor Andrew Cuomo was given variously as to save jobs at these facilities or to meet the state's carbon reduction goals. The New York Public Service Commission approved the proposed clean energy standard, which requires that 50% of the state's power will come from clean and renewable sources of energy, and they include nuclear power in this, thus stealing over $965 million from Wind, solar, geothermal, and the genuinely sustainable energies. The only thing sustainable about nukes is the nature of its highly radioactive waste, which lasts until forever. The nuclear industry is already touting this travesty as being far superior to what happened with Diablo Canyon in California, And you just know that they're going to tout it to every last one of the other 48 states to try to get them to fall in line with the program as well. This is an ugly victory of propaganda over truth, over semantic manipulation BS. And who'd have thought that Andrew Cuomo would have fallen for this or used it as a justification? This makes no conscious sense, which means that there's something else Behind it, there's some string that's being pulled that is connected to somebody's cojones, and that's why they're getting away with it. Bad precedent. Really, really stupid, ugly, bad precedent. And that's why, Andrew Cuomo, you qualify as this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Carl Grossman just published an extensive article on this very topic under the title New York's Woeful $7.6 Billion Nuclear Bailout Package. It's on CommonDreams.org, and a link will be posted on this week's episode number 267 at NuclearHotSeat.com. In Washington State, a wildfire continues to burn towards the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. The fire is now at 
273 square miles and only 20% contained as of noon today, Tuesday, August 2nd. A large area had been burned on Rattlesnake Mountain and nearby land on the Hanford Reach National Monument to keep the fire from spreading onto the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Any radioactively contaminated materials that burn will put that radiation airborne in the smoke and spread it untold distances. This is the problem that was faced in a 2000 fire in the same area of Hanford and also in the 2011 fire near the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. In Plymouth, Massachusetts, Entergy, the owners of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant, have notified the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about a problem with a neutron-absorbing panel in the plant's spent fuel pool, made of a material known as Boraflex. What's the problem? Degradation of the panel. The degradation can happen from the combined effects of gamma radiation from spent fuel and long-term exposure to the pool environment. In other words, the degradation can happen by the specific way that we have been storing spent fuel all along. According to the NRC, Entergy said preliminary results indicate the spent fuel pool is and will remain stable or the technical term of substantially subcritical. Notice nobody is using the word safe. And what does substantially subcritical mean? It's not going to turn into a nuclear explosion yet? That's not the same as safe. And when it comes to all things nuclear, we deserve nothing less than safe. Also on Monday, August 1st, the NRC sent an augmented inspection team to the Westinghouse Nuclear Fuel Fabrication Plant in Columbia, South Carolina, to assess unexpected accumulation of an excessive amount of uranium-bearing material in a plant component, a.k.a. they found unexpected and too much radioactive rad waste where it wasn't supposed to be. A six-member augmented inspection team, or an AIT, or eight, there are only six of them, but it's an eight, is formed to review the circumstances around significant, the NRC's favorite word, significant events at NRC licensed facilities. What happened is that an air scrubber, which removes unwanted material from a number of processes at the plant, was undergoing an annual inspection and cleanout. During that work, an unexpectedly large amount of material was found inside the scrubber. Upon analysis, it was found that the uranium levels were higher in that area than allowed under NRC requirements in the facility license. And then, I love the way they spin this, quote, There were no actual safety-related consequences as a result of the accumulation of material, but the potential for such consequences may have existed. End quote. Geez, don't you get dizzy from the spin? What they're saying is, nothing has happened yet, but it could. The six-member eight will review the circumstances, identify the cause or causes, and ensure that the company has taken appropriate corrective actions to restore compliance and prevent recurrence in the future. Do you realize you're talking to Entergy here? You actually expect them to do that? According to NRC Region 2 Administrator Kathy Haney, quote, it shows the need for Westinghouse management to review some aspects of their operation, end quote. No word of her tongue was firmly in her cheek when she said it. And even after all that reactor bad news, there's still room left for the nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report. On Monday, August 1st at St. Lucie in Florida, the plant shut down due to pressure boundary leakage greater than allowable limit and is currently on hot standby. Unit 1 commenced a unit shutdown required by technical specifications due to reactor coolant system pressure boundary leakage in excess of the allowable limit, which is zero leakage. 
St. Lucy, you got some splainin' to do. <coughs> At North Anna in Virginia on July 30th, the technical specification required shutdown due to reactor coolant system boundary leakage. There it is again, boundary leakage. The source of the leakage cannot be isolated, and the event is reportable in accordance with any event or condition that results in the condition of the nuclear plant, including its principal safety barriers, being seriously degraded. <coughs> At Nine Mile Point in New York on July 28th, there was a temporary loss of power to the emergency condenser. At the time of discovery, this could have prevented the fulfillment of the safety functions of structures or systems that are needed to remove residual heat. <coughs> At Beaver Valley in Pennsylvania on July 28th, a review of their fire protection safety shutdown report found that a postulated fire had the potential to spuriously open all three individual steam generator atmosphere stump valves in addition to a common residual heat release valve. In other words, they theoretically figured out that a fire could open all three dump valves at the same time. And the potential impact of these valves spuriously, I would rather use my word, spontaneously opening in a fire, is a cool down that could adversely affect shutdown margins. In other words, compromised safety. <coughs> and it just keeps coming. Salem, New Jersey on July 28th. Unit 1 initiated a shutdown to comply with technical specifications due to the inoperability of both source range nuclear instruments. The condition could have prevented the fulfillment of the source range instrument's safety function to trip the reactor when required. And the reactor is now on hot standby. <coughs> At Watts Bar on July 26th, an oil sheen was seen on the cooling tower basin. And at Quad Cities that same day, July 26th, that's in Illinois, the control room emergency ventilation system was declared inoperable, an event or condition that could have prevented fulfillment of a safety function. <coughs> Duck and cover, indeed. Over to Japan, where Hiroshima wants Pokemon Go players to go away. Japan's Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park joins the growing list of inappropriate Pokemon Go playing venues, which on last week's show we reported includes Fukushima. The park commemorates the dropping of the first atomic bomb at the end of World War II, and city officials are hoping to avoid Pokemon scavengers wandering through the annual ceremony to remember the bombing victims on August 6th. Previously, an organization in Bosnia issued an alert reminding Pokemon Go players not to venture into minefields. What if it's all a recruitment campaign for Darwin Awards? In the United Kingdom, their new Prime Minister, Theresa May, intervened to delay the signing off on the Hinkley Point deal which would have two nuclear reactors built by France's EDF that are financially backed by a Chinese state-owned company. She has reportedly stated that she has security concerns. Yeah, think? In Belarus, Russia's Rosatom has offered to replace the reactor shell its workers dropped during installation work last month at Belarusia's first nuclear power plant, something that was termed an abnormal situation. According to the Associated Press, Rosatom's Deputy Director General, Alexander Lokshin, said the vessel, quote, slipped down slowly and touched the ground softly. He maintained that the reactor was not damaged, but Rosatom stands ready to replace it with another if that would help restore public confidence in the project. Or cover its tracks. Ukraine now states that Chernobyl could be reinvented as a solar farm because, let's face it, you don't want to grow anything else there that you're going to eat. And in Australia, longtime nuclear hot seat listener Brett Bernard Stokes reports that because Tim Cooper, head of Cooper's Ale, is advocating for a nuclear waste dump in South Australia, the local beer is being boycotted. Now that's a serious protest. We'll have this week's interview feature in just a moment. But first, only six weeks to go to Excellence in Journalism, the conference in New Orleans where I will meet, greet, and butt heads with 
Some of the over 1,000 journalists, broadcasters, news directors, syndicators, and those who book guests for news programs. The networks will all be there, broadcast, cable, and online, and they all need to step up their game when it comes to covering nuclear issues. That's what I will be lobbying for, that they give us better coverage, and I'll also introduce them to Nuclear Hot Seat. If you've been listening for the past several weeks, you know that I've been raising the funds to attend, and right now I'm about two-thirds of the way there, which means I'm still around $500 short to cover the rest of my expenses. You know, room, meals, ground transportation, miscellany, and bail if things get too heated. Just kidding. This is over and above the usual monthly expenses of running this show. That's why I'm asking for your help. Yes, you, the person listening to this program. You. Won't you help an activist out? Your donation of any size, from the equivalent of a cup of Starbucks to surprise me, is welcomed and appreciated. If you look forward to listening to Nuclear Hot Seat, if you believe in what's being done to help get the information out from our perspective, Help me give it a real turbo boost by helping me secure the rest of what I need to do this trip upright. It's easy. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate by PayPal or by using your credit card, or if you prefer the old-fashioned way, by sending a check, you can get a snail mail address to use by sending an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. Whatever you can do to help, know that you have my gratitude, because it will not only get me to excellence in journalism to do the work, it will be a tangible show of support for the work itself. So thanks. Mainstream media keep falling for nuclear industry press releases, talking points, and propaganda. So it's important that we have polished strategic media pieces that take up, if not a defiantly pro-nuclear position, at least a balanced one that puts our thoughts, our perspective out to the world cleanly, clearly, and persuasively. That's what happens in the film Indian Point, a documentary directed by Ivy Mirapol. It looks at that nuclear facility variously listed as 25 miles from New York City or 35 miles from Midtown Manhattan. Either way, it's within the 50-mile evacuation zone, which everybody knows is impossible to evacuate in the case of an emergency. And that's just one of the many issues that come up when you discuss Indian Point. One of the remarkable things about the film is its focus on people from both sides of the nuclear issue to personify the various things that we're talking about. There's the Indian Point Senior Control Room Operator, activists from Riverkeeper, an activist and environmental journalist who are married to each other, and, most notably, former Nuclear Regulatory Commission Chair Gregory Yasko, who truly becomes the hero of the film. Both Director Mirapol and former Chair Dr. Yasko attended the Los Angeles premiere run, and I had an opportunity to speak with them briefly before the film began. I was at a bit of a disadvantage because I hadn't seen the film yet. But I let them fill in the blanks of how this movie came to be, the resistances they had to overcome, and how the making of the film has impacted them. I'm talking with Ivy Maripol, who is the director of the film Indian Point. And Ivy, what moved you to do this film? What motivated you? I moved outside of New York City to the Hudson Valley, and I started taking the train in and out of the city and would go right by Indian Point and just visually found it quite striking and foreboding and was curious about it. And I knew a little bit about Indian Point. I knew it was controversial. And also living, moving to a town close enough to a nuclear power plant, uh, especially one like Indian Point, you learn pretty quickly that you're in a potential danger zone. And I would hear the sirens being tested, and we had an emergency planning kit that came in the mail that was titled, entitled, Are You Ready? <laughs> <laughs> 
No. And uh, yeah, and I started, and then I noticed evacuation route signs everywhere I'd be driving, and I and you know, and then at my kids' school they would ask, you know, if it was okay to give them potassium iodide pills if something happens, and we were supposed to have those pills in our own home, and these are things I'd never thought of before, not having lived so close enough to a plant. So I wasn't particularly alarmed. I mean, people always assume that it, I'd start made this film because I was scared of the plant. I would describe it more as intrigued, and. I started doing a little bit of research and learned that the Indian Point was at the center of the most contentious license renewal process that the NRC had ever seen, or like the people at the NRC were saying it was the most contentious, for many reasons, you know, because it's close to New York City, for one. But I thought, you know, as a filmmaker, there's potential drama there. Of course, I filmed 10 days of hearings that not a second wound up in the film because it's not that dramatic. <laughs> that's intentional. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, that stuff all ended up on the... So, I mean, the hearings you see in the film are mostly these kind of public comment sessions where activists and other concerned citizens, or not so concerned, can get up and address staff from the NRC. So I had started researching, and then Fukushima happened, and I thought, well, now there's this bigger context. What's going to happen? All these activists I'd started to pay attention to, are they going to be reactivated, so to speak, because of Fukushima? And that's exactly what was starting to happen. I was seeing that happen. So that, that kind of set me off. And then the other part was I decided if I could get access to the plant, then I really had a story. Then I had something that I hadn't seen before myself, which is usually what drive me to work four years on a project like this that seemed impossible to complete. But once I got the access to the plant, they really took off from there. It was a beast to edit, I have to say, because there was no clear line. Until I had met Greg and had Greg Yatsko's story, who was the former chairman of the NRC, there was no real dramatic arc that wasn't created by us in the edit room. Mm -hmm. This was an actual story, a real storyline that pushed the story forward. Greg, at the time that Fukushima happened, and I presume that's before Ivy got in touch with you, you were the chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You were also involved with the relicensing battles around Indian Point. Mm -hmm. What is your perspective on what was happening regarding Indian Point, and how did it change once Fukushima happened? The licensing process is a very involved process at the NRC. So at the time, I, I don't recall, the commission itself, so my role, was somewhat limited. The biggest issue really you know, was a general sense of just a broader question of whether or not we should be licensing any plants given what was happening with Fukushima. That one had a very involved process that was likely going to take a long time to go through. So I don't remember anything specific at the time around the relicensing and, and Fukushima necessarily. When you were first approached by Ivy to participate in this film, were you still the chair of the NRC or were you already out? I did interview Greg once while he was still the chairman. Yeah. But it was one brief encounter that's in the movie and then later in my office. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I didn't know Ivy. And she'd been working on the film for a while at that point. And um, I was going to give a speech at a conference, which is in the film. And so I had a public affairs guy who I knew very well. And we had a good trust relationship. And he said, you know, there's this person that wants to interview you for a documentary. I'm going to go have lunch with her or breakfast or something. And I'm going to check her out. But for now, I say we don't do it. And so I was giving a press conference as for this speech, and then before the press conference, she said to me, okay, I talked to her, she's fine, you can talk to her. <laughs> and so then she interviewed me right after I did a little press conference. Yeah. But then it was a process of saying, well, now can I come to your house yeah, and do that. some lengthy interviewing? Yeah. That took a little while. I mean, Greg's not someone who relishes putting himself out there like that. I mean, like, you know, I mean that's what's interesting. Every step of the way in this film... Even Marilyn and Roger Witherspoon, who you'll see in the film. These are not people who are looking to be on camera, which, which I actually find refreshing. And I want, you know, it's like people who actually have something to say, but it needs to be about a trust with me. You know, they're not just going to spill it and trust anybody with, with their stories because it's so complicated. What was your concern or your hesitance to talk with Ivy, and what put it over the top? What made you decide, yes, I'm going to speak with her? Well, initially, I mean, I didn't necessarily have a concern. I just didn't know her. So I just listened to my public affairs guy, and I trusted him. And when he said, talk to her, I talked to her. You know, I talked to Ivy periodically, would talk to her, and she'd tell me about, you know, what she was interested in talking to me about. And, you know, I said yes, and I did one really lengthy interview. And, and then she came back to me later and wanted to talk about some more things and just 
the way my personal life was and my personal situation. It wasn't necessarily a time when I was interested in talking to people more. And she kept talking to me, and, and eventually um, I did. And, uh, and that's why she made the movie, because she, she can do that. I, you know, we, we do these Q&As, and people always ask, well, how did you do this, and how did you do that? And she's always very modest. And my, I always say, well, let me answer that, because this is why she's effective at her job, because she's able to get people to talk to her and make people feel comfortable and trust her. And that's a rare, rare talent. From my experience on the other end of documentaries of being interviewed, it seems like it's a pretty important one for a documentary filmmaker to be able to do that. And she's very good at that. And you know, she's taking your life in a certain way in her hands. You, know, you have to trust that she's going to protect you. And my son's in the movie. And that, that was a lot to get that. <laughs> and uh, she, had to, she teamed up with my wife to, to make that happen. <laughs> and... Uh, my argument was, you know, I don't want to, ex I would certainly not exploit Greg and Leanne's little boy. But that said, I know what audiences respond to. And I know how just a moment of seeing is like personal and also as a, you know, metaphor for the future. I mean, seeing Greg with his little boy, it worked on many, many layers. It showed that He's now out of a job, and he's home with his son, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but also was in the context of Greg talking about how important it is for him to do something that matters in the world. And that's having children makes you realize that even more. Greg, you were forced out of the NRC, and in the time since then, to what extent have you kept up on the issues, and specifically regarding Indian Point? I mean, I've kept up with Indian Point more than anything because of this film, and get asked a lot of questions about Indie Point because of the film. You know, to a large extent, I had my time, I moved on, and I still know a lot about nuclear safety and have a lot of opinions about things, but I, I just don't keep track of things day to day, certainly like I used to. What is your opinion of Indian Point now? This is for those people who have not had a chance to see the film yet and may take a while before they're able to. It's largely what, what I think it's been for the last couple of years. I just don't think from a public policy perspective, from it's just so many reasons, this contentious relicensing process is healthy and effective for, for the plant. And, you know, from a nuclear safety perspective, I don't want there to be a plant where there's all these distractions, there's so much public opposition, there's so much political opposition to the plant. To me, that's not an effective way to operate a, a plant that has the potential to have significant safety implications. And, and so I think the best thing that should be done there is that they should sit down, the, the plant, the local community, the governor, negotiate a settlement and agree on a certain day to shut down the plant, much like what they've done with the Abu Canyon. I mean, to me, that's the model and, and I think the most effective way to go forward. I mean, you know, at this point, realistically, even if they are effective and successful, the plant will only have you know, 15 to 17 years left in its license anyway because they're already in there operating under the new license. So it's not going to last forever. So I think the best strategy is really just to sit down and figure out a solution that can meet the goals that people want to meet from an, an employment perspective, a, a, an energy production perspective, an, an environmental perspective, and figure out what that solution looks like and just do that instead of kind of this legalistic, contentious relicensing process that I, I think at the end of the day doesn't really satisfy anybody. How have you felt about the reviews that have come out so far? Have you been surprised by them? Have they proven helpful to you in getting audiences and getting further support and distribution? They've been mixed. Not everyone's going to love the film. I mean, it's not to everybody's taste. But when people take me to task for being too even-handed, I find that a little rich. I was thrilled, you know, to get this recent review from Kenneth Turan, who's so... You know, I admire him as a critic anyway, so to have someone like him say that he really appreciated what I did means a lot. You know, it's one of these things like box office, it's impossible to know how they affect. I mean, in, in New York, you know, maybe our box office was hurt because we didn't get a great New York Times review, although we got a big story in the arts and leisure section that was, all, it was very positive and used us as an example of an issue film that isn't so heavy-handed and, and one-sided. That's not really what I do, and, and I don't think it serves an issue well to simplify. I don't see things in black and white like that. So that said, we did get a, a week extension at Lincoln Center. I don't make these films for box office, clearly. I mean, I just can't imagine ever caring that much about that, except for the fact that I want the film to, live, to continue on so that when it affects that... That's important. I think if we do well here in L.A. for a week, maybe we can go to some other cities across the country.
And if this film were to have an impact that you could envision that would really satisfy you, what would that impact be? Well, I mean, again, like I don't, I don't, didn't set out to make this film from an activist perspective. That's just not how. It's not what I do. It's not what draws me to stories. I really think of myself as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I care about issues. I obviously have a point of view. So it's tricky because I also now really care about a lot of the people who work at the plant because they're a big part of my story. Um, so what would happen? I think what the biggest takeaway is I want people to know what happened to Greg. I definitely felt like it became like a mission of mine. to I wanted people to know what had been done to him, and especially at the level of Congress, who I find like despicable. And I worked for Congress, so I'm like, I, I know what they're what people are capable of there. I know there's wonderful members of Congress, but I also know some people like Trey Gowdy really, you know, should be thrown out, you know, on their you-know-what. So I, and the way that they treated Greg, I want people to understand. I want people to understand that uh, he was trying to act as a true public servant and someone who's doing the job of what some a chairman, a chairperson of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission should do, and that industry involvement in our government is, and Greg says it, better than I in the film is is through the roof right now. We don't have good government <laughs> oversight. We don't have good regulatory processes now because there's so much influence, industry influence in politics and our regulatory bodies. I mean, I see it all the time. I mean, I'm working on another story now about how utilities are killing rooftop solar in places like Nevada and Florida. It's the same story. So to me, that's the big takeaway. It's not just close down Indian Point or close down some of these aging nuclear power plants. It's really look at what we're doing and whether we're not, like if we're going to have a nuclear power industry, let's, which we are stuck with these plants right now, let's make sure that we're making sure they're safe. Greg, with the telling of your story in this film, what do you hope is the takeaway and the future or the legacy of that portion? I don't know. I don't know that I've ever thought about that. For me, it was just fun to be part of this. It was, a, you know, it was an interesting project that she was doing, and to be part of the story of of this plant, and just captured a time in my life and a piece of my life. And it's, you know, it's fun the first couple of times I watched it to see in me, because of course I rarely ever saw what I was doing. It was just interesting. It's for me, if nothing else, it's just it's just a wonderful kind of capsule of that period in my life. Former Commissioner Yasko then spoke about what it was like to view himself when he was brought up in front of Congress. As I told Ivy, I never knew what I looked like in that hearing because, of course, I wasn't. Wa I was watching everybody else, and this is the first time I ever really got to see what I looked like. And I had less of a poker face than I thought I did. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was so tortured. yeah. So for me, that that was a neat piece of it, and you know, I had so many of these experiences, but seeing them, how they looked. It's just interesting. It's a gift. I mean, it, you know, I'm very privileged that she did this and that she took an interest in my story. And, um, you know, if nothing else, it's, it's just this imprint or that image that will be there and an opportunity to, to relive some of these things and, and um, a very think, important part of my I life. Think Greg's being modest, and he, his wife and I have talked about this before too, that he had to endure in the media being painted in one way, right? And so what I feel like in this, the film redeems him. I cast him as a hero, and I think that's what he is. So that was not going to happen if we didn't get it out there in the film. It was not being told anywhere else. Is there one thing that if you could change, you would, about your time at the NRC or about the decisions that you made? Anything at all that you would wish that could be done differently? Well, I mean, I, I wish I had gotten along better with the people I worked with on the commission. I mean, you know, I've, people have asked me that question, of course. But would I have changed my positions for that? No. I mean, yeah, I wish there were ways, but, I, you know, I, and I think about that a lot. Well, if i just done this, and, and then I always come back to the fact, well, no. At, at the end of the day, this was a big disagreement about what we thought should be done for nuclear safety. That's what this was about. And, yeah, there probably are ways I could have Held, dealt with that better. I could have interacted with my colleagues in different ways, but at the end of the day, it wasn't going to make a difference. I, I mean, it just wasn't. This was on a crash course or a collision course because of a fundamental disagreement about what we should be doing as an agency. And and I don't regret any of that. I mean, I, I did at the time what I thought was right, and looking back, I don't think, you know, I may have been wrong or done things that weren't the right thing, but I, looking back, I still don't feel like 
I did things at the time for the wrong reasons, and I still think that. And um, you know, obviously, you can always do things better in life. And and I wish, as I said, I wish that my relationships had been better with my colleagues on the commission. I just wish they had been. And I tried lots of different things to improve those relationships, and they just didn't. And you know, there's a certain point in which I think, as my mom used to tell me when I was getting in a fight with my sister, it takes two to make a fight. And I think it's unfortunate in a way that the piece of that never came out. It was always somehow that I was fighting with everybody else and nobody else was fighting with me. <laughs> you know, and that, that wasn't the case. So, uh, but we actually, I, I did want to just add, as we figure out what to do with our energy needs now, and you know, that we're trying, obviously climate change is a huge concern. And the fact that many people think that nuclear power is green, I think a big takeaway I, that I want from this film is that, yeah, it may not contribute directly to climate change in the same way that so many other dirty forms of energy do. We don't know what to do with the waste. There's waste piling up. It's very, that's a big part of the story that we tell in the film. And, at least Indian Point, abuses the Hudson River. It sucks in 1.2 billion gallons of water a day and spits it back out hotter. And it's just, it's, it's having an effect. It's not so simple to say nuclear power, oh, it's green because, you know, climate is like, uh, no, it, it's not. It's dangerous and there's, there's waste and what they do to the river or whatever body of water they sit on is not okay. <laughs> so. I can't wait to see the film. Okay. Great. We went into the jam-packed theater and watched the film. I'll give you my feedback on that in a moment. After the screening, during the Q&A, Greg Yasko showed himself to be astute, generous, and spot-on in his assessments of the industry and the problems that it faces. Thanks to taping done by veteran activist and videographer Mila Reason, we have this direct quote about Dr. Yasko's assessment of pro-nuclear so-called environmentalist James Hansen. Yasko said, Jim Hansen is a very knowledgeable person on a lot of subjects. He is not knowledgeable on nuclear power. And it is unfortunate because he's a person of tremendous stature, but he is poorly informed on this subject, and he does not appear to be interested in becoming better informed. After the Q&A, I spoke with audience members many of them activists, including several from Japan, to ask them their impressions of the film. First, we hear from Torgan Johnson, who is well known to those of us who fought against the San Onofre nuclear reactors. Note that when we spoke, it was before the Democratic National Convention, so you have a context for one of Torgan's comments. Torgan Johnson, you drove all the way up from... San Diego. All the way up from San Diego in order to be here tonight. What got you here, and what did you think of the film? I thought the film was wonderful in that. It gave the public some insight into how poorly we're protected as the public from this industry. And to see the one voice that I saw speaking out in favor of the public or in support of the public safety, Dr. Yasko, how he was pushed out of office, and to see him here now and to kind of follow up uh, on the story, uh, we showed up to show our support for him as a person, for one thing, and, and the principle that he stands for, which is to be an, a, an elected or an appointed official that the public can believe in, rely on, trust. We have so little of that right now. I really think he should run for a higher office. And the fact that he can't find any work in the industry makes me want to support him even more, because... <laughs> He should team up with Bernie or something. <laughs> this is the kind of person that Bernie needs on his team. Secretary of Energy, maybe? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That would be a logical position for him, um, especially talking about this industry and how dangerous it is. But I think the big benefit of this film is that if we can get it distributed more widely, I think there are other people that will hear this message for the first time and start connecting dots. I think the real estate industry needs to know what nuclear power means when it goes wrong. That's the big one. Those are the two big dots that need to be connected, and we're going to work on that. Torgan Johnson. Next, Myla Reason took a break from videotaping others to share these thoughts. Myla Reason, what did you think of the film and the evening we just had here? Well, I thought it was uh, amazing, and I was really happy to see that Gregory Yasko was shown to be a real hero in terms of working 
to try to prevent another Fukushima from happening. We clearly saw that the industry is compromising and risking lives of millions of people all over the country and all over the world. Myla Reason. Bart Ziegler is another activist who drove up from San Diego County, and he had this to say. Hi, my name's Bart, and I just saw the showing of Indian Point, and I thought it was one of the most compelling, important films made in the last several years. It's so, so many people sh can see it, so many people should see it. And it wasn't one-sided, it wasn't an activist film, it wasn't a pro-nuclear film, it was just an informational film that told some compelling history of people and people's lives that are, have been impacted by the industry. And we love the fact that not only did the filmmaker Ivy Mirpol show up, but also she brought one of the protagonists, former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Gregory Jasko, Dr. Yasko, and it was just a phenomenal place to be tonight to hear these people speak. Bart Ziegler. Here's Ken Aaron, who, with his wife Grace Aaron, hosted Dr. Yasko for the weekend. This movie was interesting in the fact that it found some compelling characters that you could identify with. The journalist who had a moderate viewpoint living with a woman who had an antagonistic or upset, concerned viewpoint. We and call those activists. Activists, yeah. What was the phrase? Uh, don't agonize, organize, or something like that. But she's doing that. And then the uh, compelling character in the plant who just had what's really called technically justification. You know, well, this isn't as bad as, as an alternative. We're only killing and raping four women a day. I mean, it's much worse over in the other town. They're killing and raping 20 women a day. So we're down to four. So nuclear power is not as bad as coal. So, and we're not going to be alive in 200,000 years, so what do we care? So I mean, you had different compelling characters. In that regards, it was interesting. Ken Aaron. Mickey Bay has been an activist against nukes in both Japan and here in America. What's your response to having seen the film? After seeing the Fukushima like tsunami disaster and seeing the uh, Fukushima nuclear reactors, which people are still don't know what to do, makes me desperate and sad. And people in Japan is started to forget about the Fukushima. It's been five years, but the uh, uh, media they don't cover about the Fukushima thing. So I really worry about them. Especially children who has a thyroid cancer. I think right now 177 people has a, a thyroid problem, but uh, same thing government said, oh, there is no relationship between the uh, uh, thyroid cancer and the uh, nuclear meltdown. So I think we can't forget about the Fukushima, even though it's been five years. Do you think if this movie got Japanese subtitles, it would play well in the country? I think so, yeah, especially to the children who has to take over the nuclear industry. They have to learn about the, what's going on in the U.S. nuclear industry and also what is going to happen after nuclear melted down. That was Mickey Bay. Visiting from Japan, Yuji Kaneko shared his thoughts in Japanese, translated by Beverly Findlay Kaneko. The thing that surprised me the most is that all around the world, in both America and Japan, People who speak out against nuclear, no matter what their stature, how high their stature is in society, they are cut down. And that's what shocked me the most. And as a Japanese who was in Japan during the time of the Fukushima nuclear accident, I really appreciate what Dr. Yasko has done and that he has followed his principles. I really admire him for that. Finally, 
speaking for herself, regular nuclear hot seat source and good friend Beverly Findlay Kaneko. I thought the film was absolutely wonderful in so many different ways, but one of the things that I really enjoyed the most is as an activist who spoke out against the San Onofre nuclear power plant, I really appreciated kind of sitting in those NRC meetings again with the Indian Point activists and watching all of their reactions on the different players in the whole game. It was absolutely fascinating. I really love the characterizations that Ivy Mirpal presented in the movie. They were absolutely fabulous. The camera work was wonderful. And then, of course, I echo Yuji's thoughts about Dr. Yasko. He is just a, an absolutely wonderful person uh, that follows his heart. Beverly Findlay Kaneko. As for me, I found the film professionally well done and intriguingly structured as it followed personalities from all sides of the nuclear discussion. I had a visceral response to seeing footage from the Fukushima disaster on a large screen and felt the vertigo of fear as we peered into the almost full so-called spent fuel pool, which is still highly radioactive and eternally dangerous. I quietly cheered the amazingly articulate statements made by activists to board or frozen NRC representatives. At the same time, the film seemed a bit too enamored of the footage shot inside the reactor, and the corporate rep defending the reactors felt like fingernails on a chalkboard. Admittedly, a personal response, which I trust was shared by others. I would have preferred if the movie had tilted a little more in the anti-nuclear direction. A 60-40 split would have been fine with me, as there's so much pro-nuclear information out there that I always hope for overcompensation when the opportunity arises. But still, our perspective, the anti-nuclear perspective, got a good airing, and a fairer airing than I've encountered in most other places. Indian Point is an important film. It won't put off those who believe in nuclear, but they won't get the cushy pass of a propaganda screed like Pandora's gack promise, and they just might learn a thing or two to make them pause in their automatic support for this deeply flawed technology. As for Gregory Yasko, I have to say that I now have tremendous respect for the man which was not always the case. In the early years of Nuclear Hot Seat, when he was the NRC chair, for me he embodied the worst of this devilish industry, the visible target for my wrath and frustration. I took my pot shots at him, but I didn't understand the larger context, how he was so different from the other nuclear industry-sourced commissioners. That's part of what I learned from this film. When Fukushima happened, Gregory Yasko is the one who expanded the recommended evacuation radius from 10 miles to 50 miles, which has now become the standard. He's the one who pushed to institute the safety findings of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, only to receive devastating personal pushback. He's the guy who got ganged up on by the nuke gang and the NRC, because he had the nerve and the guts to push for American nuclear reactors to be made as safe as possible. Now, four years after resigning from the NRC, Gregory Esco is still unemployed. And it seems a shame that a man of his intelligence, excellence, and heart has been shut out of an industry that desperately needs all three qualities. Now, he has written a book, and I can't wait to read it. And I agree with Torgan Johnson that, despite the fact that Bernie Sanders is no longer running for president, Gregory Yasko would have made a brilliant energy secretary. With Bernie off the table, I believe it would behoove the alternative energy technologies to get together and hire him as their alternative energy czar. 
the face of sane energy policy that is genuinely clean, green, and sustainable. And who better to do that than someone who already knows where the nuclear bodies are buried? Greg Yasko would be the perfect person to carry the metaphorical torch for energy alternatives. For a movie to do what this one did for my perspective, along with all the information it contains, makes it an important film for people to see. I highly recommend it. Indian Point, directed by Ivy Mirapol. We'll have a link up to their website on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 276. Activist shout-outs! And this is not a happy one. It's tough in our community when we lose a single activist, as we did with Michael Marriott a short time ago. But losing three in about a week feels like a body blow. It's terribly unfair. The staff and board of Beyond Nuclear are mourning the loss of two of Beyond Nuclear's founders, Judy Friedman and Lou Friedman. They chose to leave this world together earlier this week. Judy, who was 80 years old, and Lou, who was 81, were instrumental in building, promoting, and sustaining Beyond Nuclear. They shared an abiding love for planet Earth and all living things, and worked tirelessly for environmental stewardship, human rights, and civil rights, and peace. Lou was a founding board member of Beyond Nuclear and its chair. Judy was a Beyond Nuclear launch partner. Both had a long history of activism that touched many lives around the world. Judy also founded PACE, People's Action for Clean Energy, from which she recently retired after leading the organization for 43 years. Beyond Nuclear expressed devastation by their departure, but remain inspired by their humanity and dedicated to continuing the work they so wholeheartedly supported. And just today, August 2nd, Mary Beth Brangan of the Ecological Options Network let us know that Ward Young had passed away following a bike ride up Mount Tam. He was only 63 years old. Wade Young was an activist for environmental, anti-nuclear, peace, and justice issues. He met many of his lifelong friends in the activist movement, including his partner, Rachel Johnson. Ward fought to stop the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant and was successful in saving his namesake valley, Ward Valley, from becoming a nuclear waste dump. He was a journalist for It's About Times, the newspaper of the Abalone Alliance, which was a statewide California organization dedicated to stopping nuclear power. He co-founded and co-directed the Bay Area Nuclear Waste Coalition, Ban Waste, which fought to prevent the proposed Ward Valley nuclear waste dump, and lobbied successfully in Sacramento for legislation about the responsible handling of nuclear waste in California. While I did not know Ward Young, I'm deeply sorry I did not, and it is clear that he will be missed. Here's today's final thought. And it's taken from a book by Jack D. Forbes called Columbus and Other Cannibals. It's about Wedekau, an Algonquin word for a cannibalistic spirit or thought form driven by greed, excess, and selfish consumption. It deludes its host into believing that consuming the life force of others for self-aggrandizement or profit is a logical and morally upright way to live. Wedaiko hides in darkness. Conscious awareness brings it into the light. Once we see it, in ourselves and the world around us, we can know it and tame it. Artists, writers, filmmakers, poets, and performers from around the world are seeing Wedaiko in their lives. All over the world, there is a feeling that something is deeply wrong. It is often felt more than seen, an unnamed darkness that keeps millions, even billions of people disconnected from the reality of authentic, life-affirming experience. 
Too many of our so-called leaders are asleep at the wheel. They talk about economic growth at all costs as the only viable solution to mass poverty, wealth inequality, the climate crisis, and other planetary-scale crises humanity must confront in the 21st century. Those with a spiritual bend might say that a shadow presence has shrouded much of the earth. People are sleeping through the same nightmare, unable to awaken within the dream. Every time someone is seen justifying the destruction of life for profit, it's what I call. Every time compassion is vitally missing during a time of suffering, it is what I call. Every time a privileged person uses another as a throwaway toy, it is what I call. Every time, in every way, a community or country is impoverished so that others can be rich. It is what I co. To which nuclear hot seat adds, nuclear technology in all of its manifestations is what I co. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from Reuters.com, Myla Reason, whose activist videos you can subscribe to at the Myla Reason YouTube channel, org2.salsalabs.com, capecod.com, healutah.org, envirorreporter.com, cnet.com, latimes.com, irishsun.com, theguardian.com, the Union of Concerned Scientists and David Lockbaum, the lie by semantics sociopaths who write propaganda for world nuclear news, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission event notification reports, courtesy Erica Gray, and the brilliant, compassionate, serious, yet fun loving anti nuclear activists from all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are invited to join us, like us, and share our posts with your friends and family. Theme music written by me. Sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewZSentinel.com, and now broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know an online news aggregator or community radio station, broadcast that would like to carry the show, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. You can check out our archive of more than 265 shows on the website nuclearhotseat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes under Podcasts. And if you sign up in the form on the website, you will receive an email link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode in your very own email account. How do you like that? Ain't technology wonderful? Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. We are not alone. The activists are linking. And that's because we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So do not go back to sleep. None of you go back to sleep. Because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.